Oh, e ngā reo, e ngā mana, e ngā rangatira mā tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Fā tālo whātu tōpa ia, ma tōma malu lēne aso, e mō mō lava o te si ile whawtai, ma li viinga le tōa, a wālonga ngle lei, ma longa whakmaongi tātou tangata. Ki ora, tālo fa lava, warm Pacific greetings to you all. My name is Ete Rola Whaile, and I will be your facilitator for today's panel. Yes. <clears throat> so today's panel is here to inspire you, also to challenge you to be better. You know, today we're bringing you the best and also the um, uprising women of Aotearoa who are shaking things up in the internet, not only in their mahi, but also through their passion. But before we get started, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, for those who are watching live, well, if you have any questions in our conversation, feel free to message them to us, and then at the end, we'll see if we can either say two or three of them to wrap up this amazing session. Well, let's get into the nitty gritty. So, to our amazing panelists, I'll give you 30 seconds to introduce yourself. So, Sophie, I'll get you to start. The stage is yours, sis. Cool. Kia ora te whānau. Ko Sophie Hanford tōko ingoa no paika kira ki a hau. My name is Sophie Hanford. I was the founder of School Strike for Climate New Zealand last year, and some of you may have been involved in that movement, um, growing actually through the internet, through social media. So it's awesome to be here today to share some of those learnings and hopefully um, depart some of those so that we can all use the internet for impact um, and to, to make positive change for our communities and our planet. So I'm really keen um, to share some of that. So that's kind of my background. We had 170 thousand people standing alongside each other in September last year, which is 3.5% of our entire population, one of the biggest protests and strikes in New Zealand's history. Um, so I'm very, very proud that that was led by young people and a large portion of our team also young women. So awesome to be um, on this panel alongside some awesome movers and shakers, some young wahine tour as well. I'm also a Kapiti Coast District Councillor um, and I represent the Pākehiri Hiro Mati Ward holding the climate change and youth portfolios. So lovely to um, e meet you all. And yeah, as Eti was saying, flick us any questions throughout and we'll get to those at the end. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. And then off to you, Sus Alicia. Kia ora te whanau. Um, my name is Alicia Amo here, and I am from Wellington, but I whaka papa to Te Aotearoa Nui a Paparangi. Um, I am currently a full time Koha developer at Catalyst IT, which is an open source software company. Um, before I started working here full time, I was studying a Bachelor of Commerce and a Bachelor of Science at Victoria University of Wellington. I just graduated this year. And while I was studying, I was the president of the Victoria University of Wellington Women in Tech. Um, we had about 200 members and we organized networking events, workshops, social events. Um, and our main event was a conference called WITCOM, which some of you I hope have heard of. Um, and so now I'm just working on development and um, I'm also the Wellington Branch Vice President for the National Council of Women New Zealand. So that's me. I'm really looking forward to answering some questions. And thank you so much to Internet New Zealand for having me on this panel. Bless. And uh, is Molly there? Molly, are you uh, there for your introduction? Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Molly will join us shortly, but uh, let's get straight into our amazing questions. So, sisters, yes, I feel like this is like a red table talk. So, you know, we've gone through this life of tech and, you know, we all know the fields. So my first question is, what challenges have you faced in your mahi and how did you sisters overcome it? We'll start with you, Alicia, and then you can follow on onto that, Sophie. Bless. Cool, picking up with a big one. Um, there are so many challenges to being a woman in tech. And um, on top of that, there's challenges to being a brown person in tech, there's challenges to being a young person. Um, obviously, I fit into all three of those categories, so it's really hard to pick just one challenge. Um, but uh, I know that there are people that look like me who have experienced some really, really difficult things like struggling with career opportunities or uh, promotions, getting funding for their projects, uh, and on the other side of the scale, things like sexual harassment. And I'm lucky to not have experienced most of those, um, but something that I experience quite a lot is kind of the social challenge, um, people assuming my level of experience or skill or competence. Um, 
if they have these biases about me that are confirmed just if I need to ask a question, that kind of thing. And just some really inappropriate behaviour and comments, and especially at events with alcohol, which we, as we know in the tech industry, there is a lot of those. So the way I've overcome them is basically by choosing, uh, choosing my battles. And in conversation, you can tell pretty quickly whether people's questions are genuine or whether they're just trying to get a rise. And I'm really happy now to shut those down and direct them to our good friend Google, uh, where they can find many existing resources on diversity and inclusion, because it's not my responsibility to educate them, especially if they're not actually engaging with me to learn. So, yeah, I would say if, you know, if you're experiencing struggles socially, uh, just be happy with accepting that, you know, that's not your fight right now and that's okay. And there's plenty of people who have written plenty of resources online for that person to engage with if they really want to. So yeah, it's just about looking after yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Perfect. Sophie? Yeah, some of mine link in probably quite nicely to Alicia's, um, especially in organising the School Strike for Climate, obviously. Um, that was something that hadn't really been done before and because it was a bunch of us um, young people from all around the country, the youngest member of our team is eight years old. And a lot of the messages that I got personally through social media, but also, also through our School Strike for Climate platforms, some of those were pretty challenging to deal with, as Alicia was saying, kind of mentally and actually taking some of that on board um, can be really damaging to your cause and actually what you're trying to achieve. So um, for me, that was a huge challenge in trying to figure out how I can really remain connected to the why um, and to the what we were trying to achieve instead of kind of letting those negative comments and those naysayers get to us because sometimes through social media, it can be easy to kind of give it um, space through responses and through responding and through kind of adding flames to the fire, I guess you could say. Um, but actually, that's not any good for the cause or anything any good for what we were actually trying to achieve. So um, what I kind of took from that and the way that I found myself getting through it was just trying to remain really connected to why all of us young people um, were in this fight and why we were uh, standing up and organising the strike. And that's for most of us is because we want to be able to say that we did everything in our power to ensure that the next generation has a livable future and a livable planet on which they can raise their whānau and navigate their careers through, but also for our generation. So for me, remaining really connected to that why um, and as Alicia was saying, kind of picking your battles and choosing what you put your energy towards. I knew and I found out very quickly that I only had a limited amount of energy in a day. Um, and She's a limited amount She's of energy. restarting her computer. Um, and if I decided to, you know, divert too much of that into some of these negative battles or to try and respond to the, the naysayers um, through social media, that that could potentially flow far out of proportion and expand and reach more people than it needs to reach. And we just needed to spread our positive message and our message of a vision for climate justice and a better future. So trying to kind of look at that big picture um, and, yeah, not getting sucked into those comments that we might see on social media. Oh, bless. So true. So true. And I absolutely love your answers about how you guys overcome this. So, you know, you know, when we always talk about challenges and we always feel like, you know, it puts people off and stuff. So what would your advice be for our young young girls and our young sisters out there who want to pursue a career in science? Like what, what kind of advice would you give them now knowing that the challenges that you have have gone through what kind of advice would you have to give them so that they don't go through what you went through or they can prepare for what you went through so we'll start with you Sophie what what advice would you love to give to a young and upcoming woman in in STEM and technology and also or everything in that bucket oh <laughs> big question um I mean for me and th kind of from the learnings that I've had over the last year or so I would just say back yourself and back your voice um, I think it can be, as I was saying, really easy to feel torn down or to feel like there are so many people out there that don't want to see you succeed because of the colour of your skin, because you're a young woman, because you're a young person in general. Um, but I think if you surround yourself with people that will build you up and you find your tribe and recognise that actually all of us have teams, you know, we're all on this panel, but each and every single one of us has um, supporters, cheerleaders, teams, co-workers, colleagues, um, and their input and their support and their mahi is, is just as valuable as us kind of sharing this with you. So I think recognising that um, we can't do anything great alone, in my view, and that's definitely what we saw with the School Strike for Climate. So my advice would be to 
back yourself enough to put yourself out there to, to build a team because that can actually be nerve-wracking too. I mean, with Schools Track for Climate, I didn't have all the answers myself. I was like, first I want to build a team and then once we get that team together um, with people that have different perspectives and experiences to me, that's when we can build this movement. I'm not going to build it myself and I'm not going to build it with just two or three of us. We need a team of 10 of us um, and we need to really get into those conversations nice and quickly. Um, but advice that I'd say is, yeah, back yourself and build a team, uh, recognising that every single person as part of that team has something valuable to bring and that um, as someone who wants to get involved, you have the potential and the power to bring that passion and those skills out of those people and that's an awesome role to be able to play and it's so rewarding. So um, just stick with it. Persistence is also huge, um, but continue to back yourself and um, life's short, so you might as well just take the shots while you can and, and make the kind of impact that you want to make while you're here. Yeah, I, I absolutely so talk about what Sophie so said. Um, um, I, I totally agree with finding teams, finding your community, finding your people that that um, have the same passion and interests as you. There's so many of us out there. There are so many women in STEM, and I think it's really easy to forget that because the media loves to portray the overabundance of, of white men. And while that is true, there are still plenty of us. Um, so just find your community, whether that's like the Victorian University of Wellington Women in Tech, or um, there's a great uh, Wahine in Tech Wellington meetup, or um, there's the Women in Tech Slack chat. Like there are so many ways to connect with people who um, have that same passion as you and will motivate you. And you just have to keep that energy around you all the time. And also, um, make the most of opportunities if they come up. Um, where I work at Catalyst, we have an open source academy every summer, every year, um, and it's a really great way for high school students to try out open source technology and meet some mentors and just give things a go. Um, and so if you're a high school student and interested in, in studying or working in tech, I really recommend you check that out. Um, but yeah, there are so many other great opportunities such as Girlboss and uh, yeah, heaps of those. Make the most of your opportunities and find your people is my advice. Oh, bless you. Thank you. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, as we can see, our sister Molly has joined us now. So Molly, just 20 seconds so um, you could introduce yourself to everyone that's watching live. Bless. So, wait, can you hear me? You can hear me. Okay, sorry. <laughs> My computer's just being a little bit laggy. So, hi everyone, I'm Molly. Sorry for joining so late. Um, I'm a year 13 high school student at Altair College, and um, recently I was running workshops to help get more women into our, um, into our digital classes and our DVC classes, like trying to get more women into computers. Uh, I ran workshops to help get people, because we've got a computer repair workshop at our school that is run by Remojo Tech. So I partnered with, with Remojo Tech to get more people into this program because it was completely boys only previously. Oh, bless. Thank you, Molly. Well, while Molly's here, we'll start you off with our next question. So um, the next question is kind of, where did your journey start? We've already talked about your challenges and how you've given advice. But, you know, it's really important for us to start at the, you know, base one. So, Molly, would you like us, uh, would you like to start us off with this question about where did your journey start for you? Cool. Um, so... Oh, there we go. Cool. So um, my journey probably started as soon as I started high school in year nine. I saw a lot of people were really into building their own PCs. It was kind of like a thing our friends and I used to do. And I, I had known nothing about computers previously. Like I didn't even know, like, I don't even know the parts inside a computer. And now here I am fixing them. So I, it was just really the, the lack of diversity I noticed um, with these groups that were fixing computers that brought me to this point now. And yeah. Oh, bless. Uh, Sophie, would you like to add on? Yeah, sure. So for me, kind of my path into 
probably being here today and talking about um, my use of tech and the internet um, started from or kind of spurred out of curiosity. Um, when I was 12 years old, my parents got a letter in the mail from our local council, which is kind of funny now that I'm a councillor, essentially saying that um, because we live um, coastal in a coastal environment, um, I live in Pakekereke right by the beach, and essentially saying that the um, sea level could be near our garage in 50 years' time due to climate change. And at 12 years old, my parents were looking rather concerned about this letter, and, and I asked them about what it was um, and what it meant for us and our whānau. And that was kind of alarming enough when they explained it to me, but then the realisation that the people on the front lines of the impacts of climate change right now have it far worse, um, and the fact that we have such a limited amount of time to have the kind of impact that we need to have, um, was a huge wake-up call for me at only 12 years old. But that only happened because I asked a question. My parents were concerned, so I was like, what are you concerned about? Um, then I invited our local member of parliament to speak to my year eight class when I was 12 as well. And again, I asked him questions. I said, what are you going to do about my generation's future? What are you going to do about climate change? How are you going to ensure that communities like mine, but also those in the Pacific, who we have an obligation to, can stay in their homes uh, and, can, and don't have to leave their culture and their whānau and can, you know, they can only do that in a dignified way if they choose to, um, but aren't forced. So that whole conversation and asking those questions kind of then led me to developing a really strong um, passion for our environment and for ensuring that we do everything we can right now because we all happen to be alive at an extremely important moment in time where we have um, the responsibility but also the opportunity to save the entire world for the next generation and then realising that the internet and that tech can be a tool to help us to do that. We need all tools that we can get our hands on. We need everything, we need everyone uh, and realising that the internet can be an awesome tool to mobilise people, um, to spread the word about, as I was saying, the importance of right now and the importance of all of us talking about climate change and doing what we can in our own lives but also advocating uh, to corporations, to governments, um, connecting with each other to do that too. So I guess for me, out of curiosity, I began to realise that there are so many tools that we really need to get our hands on and better understand. And then that kind of coupled with the school strike for climate, beginning to coordinate that, that all kind of linked up. So my journey is a bit disjointed. And, um, but I think the main thing kind of that I, I take from my journey is the importance of curiosity. Oh, bless. Love it, Sophie. So, Alicia, would you like to wrap up our question? Sure. Um, God, I'm just processing Sophie's amazing story. Um, I have always been interested in tech since I was young. My dad, uh, who's one of my biggest supporters, would always be working out what's the latest thing, like what, what do I have to know about right now? Uh, so I grew up with conversations about tech in the house, and I guess as I studied um, I took digital technologies at school where I had some ing incredible teachers who were always telling me, you know, we need more women in tech. Um, we need more women designing the systems that we use, all these kinds of things. I went to an all-girls school. I had no idea what they were talking about. I was like, yeah, sure, um, diversity is nice, but why do we need it? And it wasn't really until I came to university and I walked into a lecture theatre of 300 people and I was one of two or three people who looked like me, I was like, okay, I get it now. And um, that's kind of what sparked uh, the advocacy and the activism side of the work that I do now. So the passion for tech and the interest in coding has always been part of me, but the, um, the social kind of stuff that I do now was sparked just by the experience of being a Maori Asian student uh, in the engineering school. Um, yeah, and I, I think it was really quite sobering seeing that difference between high school and and university. So, yeah, <laughs> not quite as inspiring as Sophie's story, but um, definitely something that I think a lot of people can relate to. Oh, wow. Well I'll tell you this, all of your stories are very inspiring. And, um, you know, I could really feel the mana from all of your stories. And there's kind of like that common theme that's running around in our conversation. It's that um, you three are very, uh, what's it called? You're activists. You're very, you 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 stand up for your, your passions and everything. So, you know, we are the generation now that's, you know, trying to make change in technology. But, you know, what advice would you give for also the next generation of our wahine? 
on like whatever they choose, but like like advice on how to be an activist and what drives you to be an activist and and what you do. So, uh, what's it called, Sophie? You can start us off because I can see that head that head tilting and I can feel the mana with this. So I'll give it to you. So oh, I was just thinking that was my thinking face. Um, I think there's so much power in intergenerational solidarity. I think that the fact that you know the climate strikes were organised by young people, but for example, the older generation said, well, it gives them so much hope. But actually, as Greta says, we don't want your hope. We want you to act and we want you to feel the fear that we fear, that we feel, sorry. So I think that the power of the older generation standing alongside us as young women and as young people, um, but then that kind of being the norm for the next generation. So to have the next generation grow up where they don't have to strike for climate, they don't have to advocate for um, diversity in tech, that they don't have to be the only brown person um, in these lecture theatres, that they don't have to feel the things that we've felt. So I think that if we start to develop those real strong intergenerational connections between our generation and the older generation and the adult, the older adults of this world, um, then we can start to really develop that as generations continue to come onto this planet and that we can then develop those real strong connections. And I think some advice that I'd say or that I'd give is just that um, kind of like, as Alicia said, like there are so many people in this space who are, and as you said, Etty, like who are making change and who are keen to make change, but also really keen to support others to make a difference um, and to use tech in any way that they see fit or that they feel passionate about um, to be able to make a difference too. So, you know, I'm always kind of open to an Instagram message or a Facebook message to just support. Um, and I think that there's so much power in that. So I'd say um, to the next generation, just know that there are all of us here and so many more of us who have had these learnings and we're really willing to share those. So never feel um, like you can't ask a question or be curious or ask about the challenges because we learn, I'm sure we've all learned things from those challenges and we've all also got success stories as well. But um, sharing those challenges and ensuring that that next generation doesn't have to experience those things um, or be put in those situations, I think, is a way that we can all contribute. And I get really excited about being able to contribute in that way. So, yeah, I'm here and I'm sure you girls, are. I don't want to like <laughs> put you girls up for it, but let's do it. Any of our sisters want to add on on your advice to any of our future wahine? Yeah, I have something just to add. Um, I just want to give the advice that uh, it can feel like you have to know everything about the thing that you care about and you do not have to know everything. None of us know everything. The best thing that you can do is is do your own research and be open to learning and be open to trying. Um, I think activism isn't about being an expert. It's just about getting in there and getting involved. Um, so yeah, don't, don't be afraid of getting involved if you're not the expert in your field because just your energy will be enough. That's all I wanted to add. Oh, perfect. Molly, would you like to share some advice for our future wahine? <laughs> Is it unmuted? Can you hear me now? Oh, sorry. It's not coming up that I'm unmuted, so I apologize. Um, my advice would be to like look into yourself and figure out your beliefs. Like, I've only really started getting into politics this year, and I'm like disappointed that I didn't get into it earlier because once you start learning more and more and like what Alicia said you don't have to be an expert but once you start learning like how other communities are affected by your vote and how other communities are affected by like what you're doing you know you start to realize that the system is <laughs> very flawed you start to um you know you start to get angry and you start to get passionate and that's like the very important part like often women are told like you don't don't be angry. Don't be passionate. You'll be, um, you'll just, you'll just be too intimidating. But that's not the truth. You need to be passionate about what you believe in and be passionate into your causes. Oh, lovely. Well said, sisters. Well said. Well, um, if only you all knew, but we have a bit of a fan club that's asking us a few questions. So our first question from our amazing fan club is, um, uh, what inspires you to keep going? And do you ever feel like stopping? Well, you know what? We'll start that off with uh, Molly. Molly, 
Uh, what's it called? You can start us off with this question, and that is again, um, what inspires you to keep going, and do you ever feel like stopping? Going is seeing, you know, the drive of other people in the community and as a, as a nation, like seeing how people are getting, you know, how people are really starting to learn more, like seeing people in my generation, in my school, like learning to learning and getting ready to vote. That's like, that's, that's amazing to see because that's not really been, been previously the case. Usually young people, are the ghost voters and such. And like, especially with causes like this, it's just amazing to see the community drive just, you know, it's always good to have people around you that are super passionate, but that's definitely something that motivates me to keep going. Oh, well said. Alicia, would you like to um, <clears throat> add on to that question as well? Yeah, I mean, I've definitely felt like stopping at some, at some points in my career, I guess I should say. Uh, you know, I've been a developer for nearly six years now, and... Even then, I get moments where I'm like, I'm not, I'm not qualified for this. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but then I, I, I remember that, you know, I, I am qualified. I've been a developer for six years, and I've got this team of people that are helping me every day to be a better developer. So I should just keep on keeping on. And then in terms of the social work, um, that can be really draining sometimes, for sure. Um, and there have been times where I'm like, maybe I should just stop and let, let the rest of these amazing women handle this. But then I remember how I um, how isolated I felt in my first year of uni when I had no community. And I remember all the communities that I can give a voice to. And just to touch on what Sophie and Molly have both already said about having your why, knowing your beliefs. Um, when you have a reason, it's so much easier to make decisions about, um, about that reason. And so that reason is the reason that I keep going always. And um, I haven't achieved the, we haven't achieved our goals yet. So the work isn't done. So we keep going. Um, and also about that support system that we've all talked about. I, I work with some really incredible people at Catalyst and I have the most supportive family of friends who, who inspire me every day. So, uh, yeah, I have every reason to keep going, really. I totally call um, both what Alicia and Molly have said. Um, probably, yeah, only a couple of things to add, and I'll try and keep this quite brief. I think for me, it's definitely a roller coaster. We can't pretend that there aren't days where I'm sure all of us and all of you listening to um, sometimes feel like giving up or changing path or um, making huge you know, shifts in what you're focusing on because maybe you don't feel like you're making the kind of impact you want to make or, um, as Alicia was saying, you feel like there are people maybe better qualified. Um, so I think trying to normalise that for the next generation to know that actually it's okay to be in that space of feeling a bit confused and lost. And I think it's the same also about knowing what you want to do kind of after high school or after university. There's this expectation that we all need to know, uh, have our life planned out. But I think it's worked really well for me just saying, as Alicia was kind of mentioning, this is my my why, is that I want to be able to say that I use my voice to its full potential to advocate on behalf of our people and our planet. And everything I do is for and because of that. So whatever form that takes is totally fine. And I think we can, if we can normalise that, that'll help us um, along the way and actually feeling okay in those moments where maybe we feel like giving up. For me, what's kind of, kept me going is, yeah, staying connected to my why, connecting with nature, so getting out onto the beach, going for a walk, um, you know, just going and sitting outside, even if I'm doing my work, um, but just kind of changing my space, listening to some music. I've got some um, jam playlists that I like to put on if I'm losing motivation or if I can feel myself slipping into a headspace that maybe isn't as productive or um, will allow me to make the most impact that I want to be making. Um, and yeah, having that team around me and having people who um, continue to kind of fill my life with positive energy. 
Oh, and you're all so true. Honestly, I could totally feel the feels. Because same with me, I sometimes want to just, you know, walk outside and find a punching bag. But, you know, we do find the mana within, and I'll tell you that. But I uh, thank you all for being that bridge for everyone else. So, um, wow, we've got well, our fan club is on fire today, sisters. So we've got a bit of a quick fire here. Uh, so we'll start with Alicia. The question is, who do you emulate and why? Or who do you look to emulate and why? So we're talking about role models or something, I guess. You know it. Um, <laughs> oh, how do I pick just one? I, I love characteristics about so many different women. I love people like Beyonce and, and Rihanna who use their, put their message into their art. Um, I love people um, like my mum who has, has just worked so hard and gone through so many struggles and is still such an, a strong and inspiring person. Um, I love people like Goris Gutterman and Marama Davidson and Chloe Swarbrick and all of these incredible politicians who are just working so hard um, for to speak for the people who, who don't get an opportunity to speak for themselves. Um, I'll stop there because I'm sure there are so many more people that Molly and Sophie will speak on. Sophie, who are your, uh, who do you look up to and why? Yeah, as Alicia was saying, for me, it's exactly the same. So <laughs> many people and there are so many people even just in my local community that I really admire the mahi of. Um, there are so many of my friends, of my family. I don't even want to risk starting to name people because I know that I'll miss people out. Um, obviously, obviously Greta Thunberg, um, the activist that began the school strike for climate movement globally. She's a huge, a huge inspiration um, to me. But there are also yeah people in kind of different areas of my life that I uh, look up to in different ways. I, I haven't necessarily ever thought about whether I try and emulate someone. I think I look up to these people and I respect uh, and really admire the work that they do and try and kind of incorporate that in whatever way I can or the energy that they bring into the work that I do. But there's, there's kind of, yeah, I don't I think there's anyone that I'm like, I want to be them. Um, I'm comfortable in the person that I am. And I just, yeah, I respect and admire so many people. And I don't even want to get started in naming, but so many people that Alicia has already named. Um, and Greta and my parents and my family and Jacinda and, yeah, so many people. Oh, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Um, probably um, two of my role models would have to be my my math teachers, Miss Sun and Miss Donova. They both came. They both came from overseas to teach over here, and I think you know they're just two women that are very motivated and very driven. And you know, even in Miss Donova had to deal with a class of students who all hated maths, and she motivated us all to keep doing our best, and she all got us to pass with an excellence in our final exams because. It was it was just having this motivation and having this drive um, that I think is really powerful, especially like um, everybody can, you know, use this, use the value of perseverance in their daily lives, especially in careers in STEM, just persevering with any challenges that are thrown at you. And I think that's amazing quality to have. So, yeah. Well, I can tell you today, you are all my role models. I'll tell you that. But, you know, you are definitely my role models. But, you know, if I have to really say another role model, well, you know, myself. <laughs> Don't you ever forget that you are also your own role model. You know, own it, sisters. Own it. Yes. Oh, bless. Oh, I love, I love, I love all your role models. And, oh, see, and we're back at it again. Our fan club definitely love us. Now, this is a very good question. Now, <clears throat> I'm a very big believer of, you know, we st we stand currently on the shoulder of giants. You know, we were able to be here because of the people that got us here. And usually the people that got us here before are the older generation, right? So a question from our amazing fan club is, um, what can we do? Or, well, actually, what can the older generation do to support our mahi? And when should, uh, when should they get out of the way? <laughs> um, or if not pass on the knowledge and let us take over if that makes sense so you know um uh we'll so if anyone wants to start off because i don't want to pick anyone now i feel like everyone's in the zen right now but the question again is how can the older generation support our mahi and when should they 
pass the baton for them to let us take over. Um, is it okay if I start? Go for it. Cool. So I think a really big thing, especially with the upcoming referendums and any other um, progressive change, for example, is be willing to, to change, be willing to understand that sometimes you can be wrong and be willing to, to move forward and to be more understanding and just be willing to take in new information. Like, I think that's a characteristic of the stereotypical um, boomer archetype. Um, <laughs> that that they do, they're not willing to listen to to um, to change and to progress. So I think that's one thing. I don't think any anybody should should get out of out of the way. I just think some people should be willing to un understand and to change. And you know, know that know that it's it's always okay to say that you're wrong. Feel free to add on, sisters. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll add something briefly then. I think there's potentially a real difference in the way that that's framed. So I think moving over um, could be another way of framing it instead of kind of moving out of the way. Because I think if you imagine the older generation there and then they move over slightly just to make some room for some rangatahi to come up and join them. I don't think it's necessarily about, um, as Molly was saying, like entirely moving out of the way and passing the baton over altogether because um, it does need to be a lot of the challenges that we're facing and the opportunities we have to capitalise on. Young people can't do that alone. So if the space is created for us, um, by all means, yeah, I'm sure there'll be so many rangasahi who will rise to that. But as you were saying, Iti, it's also like the we stand on the shoulders of giants and there's so much knowledge and um, experiences through those challenges and other things to be shared. So I think if we think about it more so as kind of like shifting over slightly just to create some more space and thinking really consciously about how we're passing the mic and what kind of voices we're hearing as part of our kind of conversations or the, um, yeah, what we're hearing kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, I think um, a way that we can be really conscious of that is just kind of looking at who we're around and looking at what kind of voices we're hearing in the spaces that we're in. And if we're not hearing enough youthful why is that um and maybe reaching out to some youth to kind of figure out what might make them feel more included or welcome in those spaces because i think that's a real challenge now is that even if the space is created um it might not even be it might not even feel for young people like a space that they feel welcome in or comfortable to be a part of and i think that goes for any um any demographic that isn't currently represented in those spaces uh, it's the same on council it's very different for me being a 19 year old on council in comparison to my colleagues who are you know the young the next youngest is 40 um and that space is there for me now but it doesn't necessarily mean um that it's any easier just because the space is there so i think it's about shifting over and being really conscious of um, who we're hearing from and why we're not hearing from potentially those youth and um, then just reaching out to some youth to have that conversation and as Molly was saying being really open-minded and having an open heart and being willing to be um, yeah to be kind of influenced or for your viewpoint to be influenced by a young person and I feel like sometimes that can um, people might see that as being you know you might be weak if you if you have your influence if you have your point of view or your perspective influenced by a young person but actually young people bring such um, an important and valuable perspective into all of these conversations. So I think we just need to, yeah, if the older generation was to shift over a tiny bit and kind of give us a hand up, um, yeah, I think that would be awesome. I just have one thing really briefly to add. Um, in Te Ao Māori, we have this tuakana taina relationship and it's kind of like older and younger it's seen as a mentorship but the thing is in Te Ao Māori is that it works both ways uh, and so that's the kind of the way that I see uh, as my response to this question is we can help each other and just adding to what Sophie and Molly have said about sharing resources and and um, shifting to the side it's about being on the same level playing field and and understanding what we can gain from each other and going back and forth yeah just yeah really brief <laughs> Oh, bless. Thank you, sisters, for this. Well, we're going to wrap it up now, but we're going to give you 10 seconds, uh, the panellists, to just give your last final words, not only just to the live stream, but also to everyone else, including us as well in the panel. Last few words to um, to end us off at this amazing panel. Bless. We'll start with, uh, we'll start with Sophie, and then we'll go Alicia and then Molly. Bless. Um, I'll 
So back yourself, know your why, and just know that we're better, stronger, and more impactful together across generations, across gender, um, across race. And if we do that, and if we recognize that, and if we're open, um, I think we can change the world. We can save the world too. Kia ora. Just really quickly, thank you so much to Internet New Zealand for having me. Thank you to Ete and Sophie and Molly for your kōrero um, and to all of the tech companies watching. Uh, think about decolonisation of your companies. There are some really great resources out there. Um, if you're operating in Aotearoa, then decolonisation is your call to action from me. Um, have a great rest of Nehui. Kia ora. I just want to say that you're all amazing. You're all fabulous. You're you're amazing people. That, and you know you can do anything you put your mind to. Um, thank you so much to Internet NZ for having us all. And I hope you all have a fabulous day. Oh, thank you, sisters. I wish we could talk for hours, but you know what? You're all welcome to come to my house. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thank you so much for watching this amazing panel. If you want to see more, well, then create your own panel where women really do run the world. Faftai, faftai, tele lava, soi fua. Ngamihi.